God created the family, He let us know how He designed it in order to function correctly. So here's the question, are you following His design for your family? Or are you building your family on your own plans? We're in a series, We Are Family, and the message for today is titled, God's Blueprint for the Family. Debbie and I first got married and started having kids early in our family. Uh, one of the things that we did when Jill was about uh, three years old, we had Jill and we had Amy. Amy was only about six months old, but we uh, felt the need to get a swing set for Jill in the backyard and for Amy as she grew up and then Sarah as she was going to be coming along. And uh, so we went to, at that time, there was a place called Toys R Us. And uh, I don't think there's Toys R Us anymore, but they had it back then. And, you know, you didn't, it wasn't anything online to look at, so you just had to go to a place. And so you'd go, and they'd have all these swing sets set up. And, and we found a cool one. It, it's similar to this one, but not quite like that. Uh, it was an A-frame metal swing set, and it had two swings, and it had a slide, and it had this uh, slider thing like you have on the right-hand side. And then where that green thing is, that was a carriage it was a really cool thing where you could get a couple of kids in there and maybe an adult and a kid. Um, and so I said, let's get that one. And so we went to buy it, and they gave me this. Uh, it, that's how it comes. <laughs> and uh, it's not quite like the, the model on the showroom. And so I had to put that thing together. And this was early in our marriage, so I, st I hadn't learned yet how bad I was at putting things together. And, but I thought, you know, I'm a college graduate. Uh, how hard can it be? You got a, a big horizontal piece. You got these A-frame pieces. And so I started putting it together. And I had most of it together. It was set up. I thought, man, this is good. And, and then the, the really cool thing, the carriage part deal that was a big selling point, you know, uh, I looked at it, and I thought, how does this go in there. And then I looked at these things that came with the boxes that called directions. And uh, <laughs> back in step two, I'm not kidding. Back in step two, you had to add something that I didn't add. I'm on like step 20. And so the only way to put the carriage in was to backtrack to step two, which meant I had to disassemble all that I had put together to put this piece in so that I could put the carriage together. What was my problem? I didn't look at the blueprints. I didn't check the directions. I thought I could do it myself, and I ended up with a disaster. The manufacturer knows how to put it together. We're in a series called We Are Family, and we're looking at what does God, the manufacturer, have to say about life, about marriage, about family. Because family is super important. You know, before God created and established the church, before he established government, before he established schools, he established the home. He established marriage and family. That was the first thing that he set up as an institution. And God has much to say about it to help you and me enjoy it. You know, the Lord didn't create marriage and family, so it would be a horrible thing. He created it so it would be a wonderful thing, and he wants us to enjoy it to the full. But in order to enjoy it to the full, you have to go by the des divine design. You have to look at the blueprints and see what does the manufacturer say about life, about marriage, about family. God doesn't leave us in the dark. He tells us how to do this thing called marriage and family. Ephesians chapter 5, I'll begin reading in verse 17. We'll look at this one verse, and then we're going to kind of be going through uh, chapter 5 into the first part of chapter 6 through the message. But verse 17 says this, So then do not be foolish. Don't be foolish. Don't be ignorant. Don't be unknowing. 
but understand what the will of the Lord is. He's getting ready to tell us his will, to tell us his will concerning life, concerning marriage, concerning family. See, every person in the family has a role, has an assignment from God. The husband has an assignment, the wife has an assignment, the dad has an assignment, the mom has an assignment, the son has an assignment, the daughter has an assignment. So we're going to look at four steps that God gives us in the uh, building of a family by God's blueprint and God's design. So the question, do you follow the divine design for your family? Maybe you say, I I don't know what it is. I'd like to follow it, but I don't know what it is. Here it is, step one. Everyone in the family needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Everyone. Mom, dad, son, daughter, grandma, grandpa, everybody, aunt, uncle, everybody needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, here's the will of the Lord, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. That is ruination. That is a waste. But be filled with with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, when the Bible says be filled with the Spirit, it's not saying you're an empty vessel and you need uh, the Holy Spirit to be poured into you. It's saying uh, you, we, you need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Paul is talking to Christians, and he says, hey, Christians, you need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, every Christian has the Spirit, but not every Christian is controlled by the Spirit. And it's interesting in verse 18 because he uses uh, being drunk with wine as a contrast and as a comparison. See, it's a contrast because being drunk with wine is a sin, and that's wrong. So, don't do that. But it's also a comparison because when a person is drunk with alcohol, that person is controlled by the alcohol. The alcohol makes that person uh, say things they wouldn't normally say, do things they wouldn't normally do. They talk different, they walk different, they act different because of the alcohol. They're controlled by the alcohol. I heard one man, he was talking to his friend, and he said, he, they were talking about drinking. He said, well, you know, I drink vodka. His friend said, oh yeah, why do you drink vodka? He said, well, you know, if you drink vodka, People can't smell it on your breath. They don't know you're drinking. His friend said, you know what? If I were you, I'd drink something else. It would be better for them to know you're drinking than to think you're stupid. (laughs) But see, that's what alcohol does. It, It makes you stupid. So the Scripture is saying, don't do that. Don't be controlled by alcohol. Be controlled by God's Spirit. And when God's Spirit is in control... You act differently, you talk differently, you walk differently. Everything changes when you're controlled by the Spirit. Now, we have the, our children's church is the the last Sunday of every month, they're in with us. And so, I have a little illustration that I thought would be good for them. And uh, so, I have my little table here, and I got some milk, and I got some glasses, And I have some chocolate syrup. Every person in this room is in one of these three, represented by one of these three glasses. Now, we're going to say the milk is a representation. The milk in in the glass is a representation of a person's life. And so, we always drink Fair Life milk. I don't know if you found that to be a good... Uh, buy for your family, but man, we love it. And it's uh, just a little plug, 50% less fat (laughs) and 13% or 13 grams of protein. So we have these lives here, and uh, the chocolate syrup represents the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible says that there are three types of people. There is the natural man, there is the carnal man, and there is the spiritual man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness 
to him, and he doesn't receive them because they're spiritually appraised. So this is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is outside the life of the natural man. This, this person has been born once, never born again. They've never received Christ as Savior and Lord, so the Lord is outside of their life. That's the natural man. And then you have the carnal man. Now, the carnal man, woman, boy or girl, this is a person who's received Christ. And when you receive Christ, you repent of your sin and you put your faith and trust in Christ, the Lord comes to live inside of you through the person of the Holy Spirit. So let's say here's the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside this person. But the problem with the, natu- with the carnal man is the Holy Spirit is there, but the Holy Spirit is not filling that person. So this person and this person, they look real similar. They walk very similarly. They talk similarly. They, uh, everything kind of looks the same. It's hard to tell that this person is a believer because they're not filled with the Spirit. Now, this person, the spiritual man, this is the person who's received the Spirit. He has as much of the Holy Spirit as this person. But here's the difference. And I forgot a spoon. Wouldn't you know it? I have to use this one. But uh, this was for a different illustration. So anyway, this is the person. Debbie told me I have to use a lot of, we got to get more Holy Spirit in this guy. Uh, (laughs) But to be filled with the Spirit, it doesn't mean, uh, it kind of messed up the illustration, because it doesn't mean you get more of the Holy Spirit. It means the Holy Spirit gets more of you. The Spirit is in this person. See, sometimes we think, well, if I'm, if I'm not filled with the Spirit, then I need, the Spirit must have leaked out, and i got to get more of the Spirit. No, to be filled with the Spirit means the Spirit has more of you. Years ago, there was a group that wanted Dwight L. Moody to be their speaker. Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist of the 1800s. And they said, we need to get Dwight L. Moody, Dwight L. Moody, Dwight L. Moody, uh, these guys that were putting on the, the conference. And one guy said, why does it have to be Dwight L. Moody? Does Dwight L. Moody have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? And somebody said, no, Dwight L. Moody doesn't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, but it sure seems like the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Dwight L. Moody. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. He controls you. Every inch, every ounce, every nerve, every fiber that is in your being, you're surrendered over to the Spirit. Now, verse 18, do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That's not a suggestion. That's a command. We're commanded to do that. And that's probably the most broken command in the Bible because so many Christians live like this when they could live like this. And living like this is wonderful. (laughs) Very good. So, when you're filled with the Spirit, as a mom, as a dad, as a son, as a daughter, what happens? Well, Spirit-filled families enjoy the fruit of the Spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the self-control. It says in verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. When the mom and dad, when the son and daughter are filled with the Spirit, the home becomes a joyous place. The home becomes a sweet place. There's a song in the air, so to speak, because there's a song in the heart. You know why some people don't sing in church? It's because they don't have a song. We used to sing that hymn, There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. He keeps me singing, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. That's being filled with the Spirit. There's joy there. There's gratitude there and thankfulness. And there is a submission one to the other. You mark it down. Any person who must have his own way, her own way, that person is not filled with the Holy Spirit of God because there is submission to the Lord and to the authority structures that he has set up when you're filled with the Spirit. So that's the very first step. Everyone in the family needs to be filled with the Spirit. Now, 
when Paul says that, then he goes off into the husband and wife relationship, the mom-dad relationship, the child-parent relationship. We need to be filled with the Spirit, not just to teach and preach and sing. We need to be filled with the Spirit to do life because we can't do it by ourselves. You know, the Christian life is not hard. It's impossible. No one can do it other than Jesus. And so God doesn't want your help. He wants your surrender. He just wants you to say, Lord, fill me up. I yield myself to you. That is to be filled with the Spirit. So that's the first step. Everyone in the family needs to be filled with the Spirit. Second step, every spouse needs to do the job that God has assigned. The husband has a job assignment and the wife has a job assignment. And the scripture goes on to talk about the job assignments for the husband and the wife. Let's talk about the husband first. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself. What's the job assignment for a husband? A husband's job is to love and lead his wife. That's straight from the Lord. Nine verses about the husband, three times God gives the command, you love her, love her, love her. Love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Love her sacrificially and lead her as Christ leads the church. And love her as your own body. Love her as yourself. And love involves nourishing her and cherishing her. That's what we just read. Nourish her and cherish her. Nourish is a providing word. Cherish is a protecting word. And we are to do both because nourish and cherish are embedded in the word love as a man loves his wife. That's her greatest need, to love her. Now, what do you do, guys, if your wife is not very lovable? Maybe it's a bad time, and uh, she's, she's, you know, it's, 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 it's one of those times. And uh, it's a bad time, and uh, she's not very lovable. You say, well, I, I guess I'm off the hook because I love her if she's lovable. No, you love her as Christ loved the church. Are there some times that the Lord would say you're not very lovable? Sure. Does he not love you because you're not lovable? No. He loves you regardless of how you are. And so I'm to love Debbie regardless of how she might act. And she acts pretty good most of the time. But, but if there's a bad day in there, I still love her. And, and I nourish her and I cherish her and I lead her. She needs that. And that's my job assignment from the Lord. And so one day I'm going to have to stand before God and he is going to ask me, I gave you... Debbie, as your beautiful wife, how well did you love her? How well did you lead her? Because that was your job assignment from me. And I'm going to have to give an account for that. Now, guys, one way to think about your wife, think about her like a flower. She's like a flower. You're the soil. Your wife will glow and grow or dry and die depending on how you love her, how you nourish her, and how you cherish her and lead her. You're the soil. She's going to respond to you for good or for bad. And so God says, hey, husband, do your job. Love and lead your wife. Well, what's a wife's job? Let's get off the husband because it's getting convicting. Let's go to the wife. And uh, what's a wife's job? A wife's job is to respect and submit to her husband. He said, did he just say submit to my husband? Yeah, I did, because that's what the Scripture says. Look, verse 22. Wives, 
Be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. See, he's the leader. He himself being the savior of the body. He's not better than you. He's just the designated driver. He's been put by God in the head coach's chair, and you're in the assistant coach's chair. He says, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything, to be submissive and subject to their husbands. Then he goes on in verse 33. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. That's a wife's job. You say, I think an easier job might be to love my spouse, but I have to respect this guy? Yeah, his job is to love you. Your job is to respect him and to submit yourself to him. That word to uh, be in submission to him Hupotasso, it means to, it's a military term, it means to rank under. You put yourself under him before the Lord. You're serving the Lord by putting yourself under your husband. It doesn't mean he's better than you, he's not. You guys are equal before God. It just means that God has different roles for the husband and for the wife. And if you say, well, I don't like that, I'm going to do it my own way, feel free. But you're not going to get the blessing of God. You're going to put together the swing set and leave out step two. And it's not going to work. And the Lord's going to say, hey, you know, you're going to reach a point where you're going to say, man, this didn't go very well. It's like, yeah, do it my way. I set it up to be a blessing as long as you follow the blueprints, as long as you follow the directions. So if a husband will love his wife, a wife will see to it that she respect her husband, life will go like this. Now, Debbie reminded me as I was going over this message with her, uh, just the part about the wives. I didn't really go over the husband part. Uh, no, I, I went over it all. But I, she said, you know, the bouts of submission. She said, that doesn't really come into play until you disagree. I mean, it's fine. If you agree on everything, the wife doesn't really have to submit to anything. She's just like, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, that's what I do. That's what. And then all of a sudden, he's, no, I wouldn't do that. Let's not do it like that. That's a dumb way to do it. As she might be thinking that. Hopefully, she's not saying that. Otherwise, he's going to have trouble loving her. Uh, but, but she, you know, so Debbie said, when, when we hit an impasse, that's when the submission is hard. That's when it comes into play. Will I yield my will to my husband's? And will I keep building him up and respecting him even if he's not very respectable? How do you do that? How does a husband love his wife when she's not lovable? How does a wife respect her husband when he's not respectable? Step one, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't do it in and of yourself. You need the Holy Spirit. You have to be this person. You can't be this person or this person. It not, it's not going to work. Only Jesus can enable you to love her no matter what, to nourish her and cherish her no matter what. Only Jesus can help you, ladies, to respect him and submit yourself to him. Now, obviously, all of this submission is in the Lord and under the Lord. If somebody's asking you to do something that would break the law or, or uh, violate Scripture, you don't do that. I mean, the Scripture makes it clear. Uh, Daniel was a godly man. He wouldn't eat the king's choice food. He wouldn't, uh, his three friends, they wouldn't bow to the image. I mean, there are times where you have to say, no, I can't do that if it violates Scripture. But that doesn't happen very often in marriage. And so you submit yourself. You love her. And that's what God says, you do your job. And see, I remember talking to a lady one time in counseling. She was telling me how awful her husband was. And he, she made him sound just horrible. I said, good night. Why would you marry that guy? He's horrible. Oh, he wasn't like that when I married him. It's like, well, you made him that way. Well, look at you. What did you do to that poor guy? I said to her, I said, you know what? God is not going to ask you how well did he do his job. He's going to ask you how well did you do your job. You know, if you have a performance review in, in business, you don't normally go before your boss and he's saying, now let's, let's talk about your fellow uh, worker, how well is that person doing? No, they talk about your performance, and God's going to do that with us. Hey, husbands, do your job. Hey, wives, do your job, and God will bless. So every spouse needs to do the job God has assigned. 
Step number three, every parent needs to set the stage for the home. Verse 4 of chapter 6. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Every parent sets the table and sets the stage for the home. Now, here are some things that you need to establish in your home if you want to have a home that God can bless. Number one, very first, uh, right off the bat, very first thing, the Lord is king. You say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Jesus is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone of our home. The Lord is king. And that goes back to step number one. Be filled with the Spirit. We're, we're, gonna be, we're not going to be this kind of family, and we're not going to be this uh, carnal kind of family. We're going to be a Spirit-filled family. The Lord is King. And you let the kids know that up front. Secondly, the marriage is priority. You know, when you start having kids, kids can start to... Uh, put a strain on the marriage. We think that, oh, kids will bring the marriage together. I remember this one lady told me, she said, you know, this couple's really having trouble, but maybe they could have a baby and that would bring them together. I said, you have six kids, right? I mean, you know that that doesn't work like that. You, part, you put kids into the mix, that puts even more strain on the marriage. The marriage is priority. The marriage has to be solid for the family to be solid. And if the marriage goes south, it greatly affects the family. So you have to keep the marriage a priority. You have to say, hey, next to our relationship with the Lord, this is the most important relationship we have, is the relationship one to the other, the husband to the wife. And listen, I realize that there are many who are in second marriages, and they're experiencing blended families. And anyone who's experiencing a blended family, they can be a wonderful thing, but it is obviously going to be more challenging because you have exes involved. You have other grandparents. You add, start adding a lot more people to the mix. And I appreciate Bill and Rhonda King leading our blessed and, married and, and blended class, uh, blended and blessed on Wednesday nights. And we're, we're here to, to help people in their blended marriage because you face different challenges. But even in a blended marriage, you have to make sure that the marriage is solid and secure. So those kids who've experienced the, the trauma of a divorce don't experience that again. Marriage is, is critical. And uh, so you need to take time for the marriage. You need to have a, a date night. Preferably have a date night once a week. You're going to just, you and your, your spouse, you're going to go out on a date. It's separate from the kids. We're just going to be together. Maybe it's only 30 minutes, but you're just going to be together. You need to have uh, an overnight, quarterly, that you spend together and that you rekindle your love for one another. Those things are important. Little things like that go a long way. Guys, you know the best thing that you can do for your kids is to love their mom. To love their mom. And moms, the best thing you can do for your sons and daughters is to love and respect their dad. And even in a divorce situation, guys, don't ever talk bad about your son, your daughter's mom. And moms, don't ever talk bad about your son, your daughter's dad. They love their mom. They love their dad. They don't want to hear you tear them down. And even if they do things that are uh, reprehensible, you treat that and treat that person with respect. Hey, the marriage is priority. And then thirdly, the kids are loved and disciplined and led. See, he says in verse 6, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Discipline, that word means training, instruction, nurture, and chastisement. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 15, that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Has anyone found that to be true? That kids come out of the womb and they're kind of foolish? Sure. Some of you are afraid to 
say something because your kids are in here. But foolishness, I mean, that's what the Lord says. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. And the Lord says that the rod of discipline, once you clean off the chocolate milk, the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Debbie and I had a wooden spoon that we let the kids know that this is our rod of discipline. You get out of line and you disobey, then we're going to apply the rod of instruction upon the seat of your understanding. We're going to let you know that that is not going to fly. Well, you, just, you know, once you set the stage for that and that you follow through with spankings, I'm not talking about child abuse, I'm talking about spankings, then you, they, all you have to do is point to the spoon. The kids are like, okay, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. You know, they don't want that. Sarah, my little one, she, she, you know, Debbie said all the girls just had me like this. And uh, Debbie is the, she was bad cop. I was always good cop. And so the girls, you know, if they had to get a spanking, little Sarah knew how to just play me. Uh, she'd just cry those big tears and, you know, she'd be so apologetic. And <clears throat> she still says that. I don't remember this, but she says, Dad, I remember one time you spanked the bed and you said, just tell your mother that I spanked you. <laughs> I said, I don't, I don't remember that, but <laughs> let's keep that between us, you know. But listen, this is important to discipline them and to teach them and to instruct them on life and in the ways of the Lord so they know how to operate and how to act and, and how to understand who God is. I love, love the little phrase. It's so true. It says, a child is going to have a hard time finding a father in God unless he finds some of God in his father. So you need to be an example. We talked about that last week. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather you go with me than merely point the way. The eye is a more ready pupil than ever was the ear. Good advice is often confusing, but example is always clear. And so you need to be an example for your kids, and you need to train them up and discipline them so that they know this is how we are supposed to be and this is how we're supposed to act and this is, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. Kids need to know that. They're loved, they're disciplined, and they are led. No home is to be kid CEO. No home. And now the kids will char they'll challenge you on that. Because kids are, they're ingenious, and uh, they, they want to take over. And so they, it's just innate. You know, they, they come into this world, and it's whatever they say goes. When they're little, when they cry, you jump, and you have to do all these things for them. And they figure it out. You know, if I cry and throw a fit, then mom and dad do things my way. And it's a slow fade where you get into a home where all of a sudden the kids are calling the shots, and the parents are obeying the kids. Don't have a home where the parents obey the kids. That's why you need a spoon. Uh, the kids can't operate the spoon. You operate the spoon. And I, I still remember Debbie is bad cop, iron will. I mean, she, what I love about her, what attracted me to her uh, very early on, other than how beautiful she was, was that she's disciplined. I struggle with discipline. She is disciplined. You look up discipline in the dictionary, it's her picture. I mean, it's just dis she's disciplined. And so the kids would challenge her, and she would say, if you ever have a battle of wills with me, you just know you will lose because she's iron will. And when Jill was little and, and uh, we had gotten past, you know, the getting up in the middle of the night for feedings and all that, and so now it was sleeping through the night. Well, then she had this little uh, hiccup where she didn't want to sleep through the night, and she realized, hey, if I cry, they'll come get me, they'll rock me, they'll feed me, they'll do whatever, and maybe if I continue to cry, I'll get to sleep in their bed. And so she would do that, and uh, I'd just be like, oh, Debbie, let's just, just get them. I just get her. I, don't, I just want to sleep. And Debbie's like, well, I can't sleep if she's in our bed. She said, I'll stay up all week if it necessary. She's not going to win. And she didn't win. Debbie won. And that kind of set the tone. Everybody's like, don't mess with mom. I mean, mom. But I, I love that about it. She, she was bad cop. And see, in, in marriage, and that's why it's so hard to parent by yourself. 
Because if you're not a naturally disciplined person, I'm not naturally disciplined, then doing that is hard. And so typically one of the two of you is more disciplined than the other. But you got to lay down the discipline. you got to let the kids know we're in charge. You're not in charge. And listen, I'm not here on this earth to be your friend. I'm here to be your parent. And if you will do a good job being the parent when they get older, you'll be their friend. You'll be their friend. That's how it works in God's economy. So every parent needs to set the stage for the home. And then step number four, every child needs to obey and honor his parents. (laughs) Verse 1 of chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Now, there's two words in there. There's obey and there is honor. Now, God wants you to obey your parents until adulthood. Obey your parents when you're a kid growing up in their house. Obey your parents when you're still on the parental dole. You obey them, you know, the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. So if you say, well, I'm out of the house now, Uh, I'm in college. Yeah, but they're still paying for your life. So you need to obey your parents until you become a full-fledged adult who pays his own bills, who lives in his own place. And that word to obey means, literally means to listen under, to hear them and heed them. And God says, That's what a child needs to do, to obey his parents. Same thing that I said about a a wife respecting her husband and submitting herself to her husband. If your parents ask you to do something that's immoral or against the word of God, you don't do that. But that's not happening very often. You come in when they say to come in. You clean up when they say to clean up. You, You live under their rules. God says that's important. This is right. So you obey your parents until adulthood But you honor your parents until death. See, honor is different than obey. Honor means literally in the Old Testament to honor. That that meant uh, kavod. That was weight. That's used for glory. And, And your parents, you give your parents honor. You give them glory. You say, mom and dad, you're special because you're my mom and you're my dad and I'm going to honor you. I don't always obey you, but I will honor you. And listen, mom and dad, you just know this. As your kids get older, you need to shift from manager to consultant. You don't manage them anymore. When they are adults, then you just consult, and only consult when they ask you to consult. So you see something going haywire in their lives. Pray for God to put it on their hearts to ask you about it. But if you start to meddle in their lives and meddle in their marriage and meddle in their family, that's not a good thing, and you're going to make it hard for them. So their responsibility before God, honor when you're young, or obey when you're young, honor all throughout life. And God says, if you do that, it'll go well with you and you may live long on the earth. You know why our nation is in such terrible trouble today? A lot of it has to do with dads, because we're not doing verse 4. We're not training up our children in the fear and instruction of the Lord. We're provoking them to anger. We can provoke them to anger because we're not there for them. We can provoke them to anger because we're too harsh with them. God says, don't do that. We have a lot of angry people. I think I told you before, in prisons, Mother's Day, male prisons, all the prisoners want to send their mom a Mother's Day card to tell them how much they love them. Father's Day, very few want to send a card to their dads because so many of the guys in prison had a dad who wasn't there, a dad who was abusive. Listen, we can change that in our homes because we can be people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. We can be husbands who love our wives. We can be wives who 
submit and respect our husbands. We can be a mom and dad who set the stage for our home, especially when your kids are little, and we can be children and sons and daughters who obey our parents and honor our parents until death. If you do it God's way, God will bless, and your home will be the greatest blessing this side of heaven. Thanks so much for watching. As we get ready to close out today, I wanna to ask you, do you know for certain that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? If not, today is the day for you. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my heart to change me. I surrender my all to you. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching and to know that God is using this program to make a difference in your life. Please contact us with the information on your screen. And remember this, you're important to God and you're important to us, and we're here for you.